on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. At the time, it was easy to paint like, you know, the big publishers as the enemy and we're all fighting them. It's a little bit different now because, well, we've basically won, right? Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, it's The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Oh, stop that, James. I love the theme tune so much. I love it when QuickTime plays on a loop. I'll tell you what, if I do that, <laughs> that's called the porn slam. <laughs> Someone walks in, <laughs> slam. Uh, yes, and we've already got our explicit tag. We're in 10 seconds in. This is a first for the self-publishing show, Mark. We normally, we're either, sometimes we're in a room together. But most often I'm in a garden office. Shed. A shed. You're in an office in Salisbury and we have a Zoom link up. And uh, we do. We chat. We, yeah. we, we, we I, banter. We spiritually nourish each other for a bit. Hmm. Sounds ruder than it, it actually is. And then we have our guest piped in. And here we are with an abs absolutely amazing experience of a live recording. We have a room full of people here at NINC 2019. Say hello, everybody. Hello. Woo. <laughs> this is excellent. We have beer, which we don't normally we have. Do. I'm going to get my beer. We have two guests for the show, but we want to hear from people as well. So we want questions to come in from the audience. We're going to do that thing where they change the guest halfway through. I have, I've always wanted my own chat show. There's going to be music in between the guests. And John Dyer's going to do a little dance <laughs> at some point. And we need to introduce the team. Uh, so uh, I think we counted that seven people are involved in every episode of the self-publishing show, getting it out. Uh, we film it now as well, which makes it all complicated. So we have John Dyer, who does most of the work in the background of uh, getting everything ready and out. Um, I'm James Blatch, you probably know. This is Dawson who you might know. Standing over there is young Tom, who's, well, I mean, they grow up so quickly now, don't they? But he's, uh, he's 31 years old today. Yeah. And um, the rules, the long tradition that was established yesterday morning with uh, Sissy Mecca, who is in here, Cecilia Mecca's over there, is that the birthday person wears Minnie Mouse ears. So, I've got pictures of Cecilia Mecca with her Minnie Mouse ears on all day yesterday. So far, Tom Ashford has had them on for about 20 seconds. So, Ashford, put them on. Put them on. Put them on. There we go. I don't understand why he doesn't want to wear them, because for me, that, that sets him off. It completes okay. the look. Right. Have we done enough of the witty banter? I think so, yes. People don't like banter. We get, com we get complaints about banter. Do you like There's the one banter at the beginning? Yes. You have to say that. There's one person on YouTube, if you look through the comments, he will always say, for the last, I don't know, eight weeks or so, he'll say, interview starts at 4.59. <laughs> with an eye roll. Yeah, he there's... Like the comments. There's a word for people like that. Yeah. Rhymes with... Well, no, We've so. already got... No, don't. <laughs> Easy, Tiger. Okay, right. So we're going to have two guests. We are going to talk about self-publishing, uh, but we want it, obviously, to, uh, to be... Lightish. Well, I don't know. It's, we've got Dave Gochran, so who knows yeah. where this could go. <laughs> David, how would you describe... Mark described you once as the shop steward of indie authors. I think it's a good description. Would you, would you go with that? Shop steward, punching bag. It changes week to week, you know. <laughs> well, we're not going to punch you. We're going to talk to you. I think we were going to start with a sort of helicopter view of indie. Mm. Uh, you have been instrumental, I think, in, in shining a light on some of the darker areas, some of the practices that are going on, which... Um, benefit individuals and do great disservice to lots of other people working hard, uh, people in this room. So we'll talk a bit about that. But generally, bearing in mind that's kind of the area you look at, do you th are you feeling optimistic and pumped about self-publishing or do you think it's difficult at the moment? Well, I'm always optimistic. You know, like one thing you have to remember, um, like sometimes you might think that, you know, everyone's sales are down or, or that, you know, nobody's doing well at the moment. But people who are maybe going through a tougher patch, tend to share that a bit more than someone who's, who's doing very well. Especially if someone starts a thread and they're saying, you know, my sales are down this year, and there can be all sorts of reasons that can happen. Like, people aren't going to come along and go, well, actually, I'm doing fab, you know, because that's not, not a very nice thing to do when someone is kind of pouring all that out. So I think you need to keep that in perspective. I yeah. think, you know, things are changing all the time. So 
you have to look at what's working for people and what's not working for you and, and be honest about you know your own setup and where you need to there's always something you can work on you know and just just kind of look at where you might need to improve or what has changed yeah you're absolutely right we are as humans we are first quick to complain aren't we and then maybe yeah. keep quiet when things are going okay one of the joys of the job that John and I do when we come abroad is we drop in on people who've done Mark's course. It's for commercial reasons, I'll be quite honest. We interview people with testimonials and say, what difference has the course made to your life? A little advert for the course. But it's joyous listening to people who have found self-publishing. They've really benefited from the democratisation of publishing and it's changed lives. We've seen people quit their jobs. There as people in this room probably whose partners have quit their jobs as well mm -hmm. and are working as a team together and that's brilliant. So we should remind ourselves about that success. Yeah, it, it's, I think I was talking to one of the book book people and they said one of their favourite trends in publishing was uh, women retiring their husbands to yes. work as their, yeah. their assistants, which is funny. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about that this week, did we not, with Cecilia Mecca who's back there. In fact, let's get the microphone for our first audience bit. I knew Cecilia would be up for this. <laughs> So Cecilia, just tell us your little story for, you've been probably two years, was it you quit your job? Um, after two and a half books, so it was about a year into indie publishing that I replaced my income with, uh, it was a 20 year education career and yeah, I might have waited a month or two, but no. Yeah. <laughs> that first month I thought, okay, this, this might be a good thing. So I was coming into September, new school year, and just didn't go back. And so it worked out well. Yeah, and you're writing hi historical Historical romance, romance. Yep, Scottish, medieval, Scottish. A lot of kilts. And English, too. And English. Yeah. <laughs> Any Irish? N mm, not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after this weekend. <laughs> I don't know if, if Sarah is in here who writes Welsh historical romance. I met a Welsh historical romance person. So I so. was you, introduced to her today. There you yes. go, good. I need Lovely. to get together. Good, okay. And now the reason I wanted to get the microphone to you is because you are you're on the path to retiring your husband, right? That's my next goal, yeah. He, he does a lot for me. Um, so, yeah, I would love to be able to kind of pull him in even more. Now he works at work on my books, so I'd like him to not have to do that at lunch and all that kind of thing. So that's my next goal, is, yeah, to kind of pull him in. I think it's a, a reasonable, realistic, um, maybe two-year path, and that would be fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Cecilia, and happy birthday yesterday. Thank you. We went and Thank played you. at Disneyland yesterday. I miss my Disneyland. ears, but they're yeah. in your hands. <laughs> Don't move them. It's taken a while to get them up there. Um, and the reason we call it democratisation, and this is special, is because the sort of earnings that people have that enables them to retire, retire, quit their jobs and work as a writer full time, are not the sort of earnings that would work on a traditional contract very often. They just wouldn't be enough. They wouldn't be interested in that level. But, it, but 50 to 75 grand a year is enough for somebody to quit their jobs and live. Yeah, and, and I think uh, it, it takes people a while to figure out, especially people coming from maybe the traditional side or people who have been chasing that side, that we actually need to sell quite a few less books than them to make the same amount of money. You know, So while it might seem unattainable when you hear people posting some real headline numbers, like there is a way to bootstrap your way to that. You know, And you can do it step by step. Like I think one of the challenges for people who are starting off especially in 2019, like if you look at the how much the complexity has grown in what we're doing with email or Facebook or Amazon, and it's changing all the time. Getting it's not getting simpler; it's getting more complex. Um, I think you know I would like for people who are starting in 2019, it might seem like an impossible task to get good at all these things, but you don't have to get good at everything overnight. You can take it step by step. You can say, you know, first I'm going to tackle email and get my email game really strong, and then I'm going to you know bolt on AMS, and or then I'm, I'm going to do book bulb ads or something else. And just take it step by step, and then it's, then it's all very doable. Because I, like, I like to think of it as a career, not like, you know, I'm going to be number one on Amazon next year. But like, I'm going to develop, you know, I'm developing my craft, but also the business side too, over time. Yeah. Now you it's it's worth, actually, worth saying, you, see, you often see these, these um, authors who come from nowhere get to the top of the charts very quickly. Now, we can perhaps talk about that, how that's happening in a minute. But those aren't the authors to focus on. It's the authors, who, who, as David says, you start slow, start selling a few books, then selling a few more books, and before you know it, you're maybe you're making your, your, your income from your day job every month, then you double it, and then you, then you can you know, concentrate on full-time. And, and that can take six or seven years. It took me, I don't know, five years before I, was, I felt comfortable enough to, to give up and write full-time. And I think that's, that's more of a, that is a typical path. It's easy to focus on those kind of shooting stars, but there's lots of reasons why that's not always a very good idea. Yeah, and that's, um uh, also, how risk averse an individual is, there's a different point at which you're comfortable making that big change. I've quit jobs and changed careers a couple of times in my life, and I do it 
easily because I'm reckless and pay no attention to the financial consequences. Quick jobs. That's not what I hear. <laughs> yeah, I've shifted careers for various reasons. The porn's but other people, and I've got <laughs> friends who've yeah, I've got other. Fr we had a job together where we had to watch porn. It was a, if you slammed it down, you'd get sacked. Um, that's another story. But yeah, for some people, I've got friends who look at what I've done and they just couldn't imagine them doing it, changing careers and risking stuff and taking pay cuts and building up again. But other people will be more risky. I mean, you're, I think you're relatively risk averse. I think you quit quite late. I am quite cautious, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was going to ask you about Let's Go Digital. Which, when, what year was that published? 2011. I had sold 150 books at the time and decided that gave me enough experience to tell other people how to do it. <laughs> Which, looking back now, was obviously the craziest thing ever. I'd been self-publishing for six weeks or something, you know. I'd self-published two short stories. I haven't even self-published a novel yet. So it was, it was the craziest idea, but it, it, it somehow worked out. Yeah, and you've... Have you updated Let's Go Digital? Or you, I know you published the second book. Yeah, no, I'm on the, I'm a, I'm on the third edition now, actually. Yeah. Um, I update it every few years. Yeah. yeah. And there's one, if you haven't read it, it is probably the first book I read when I was learning. And it's still a book I'll go back to. Um, apart from having a great beard, he, he, he knows his ship. Yes. And that brings me on to another I just want to talk about briefly is that, before we talk, I do want to talk about some of the scamming and the stuff that you've, you've shone a light on. But uh, this is a community that helps each other which I love about this community. It's one of the best things about it is that people want to share their, not just their success or their failures, but they want to share best practice and learn from each other. And so many people seem to be willing to help each other. That's something that doesn't exist in a lot of other communities or occupations. Yeah, and like that, that, that's one thing that, you know, the scamming is kind of, um, I wouldn't say it's ruined that, but it has introduced this negative element, this kind of element where people are more competing against each other or you know, have negative feelings towards each other. Whereas I think it was a bit more pure in 2011 in terms of we were all working together against a common goal. At the, at the time, it was easy to paint like, you know, the big publishers as the enemy and we're all fighting them. It's a little bit different now because, well, we've basically won, right? Um, but yeah, no, I think you know, having problem, problematic actors in the community does kind of change the atmosphere a little. And it would be great if some of the people who have the power to solve the problem would actually care about it a bit more. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So what are the, n the top sort of scamming techniques? We know book stuffing is, is one, but there's other things going on at the moment, isn't there? Well, you this perhaps shouldn't mention names just in case. Yeah, whatever. yeah. Um, this, this is the thing, right? Um, everyone always focuses on the book stuffing because, you know, when myself and, and Phoenix Sullivan and a bunch of other authors, like I'm, I'm far from the only one, were blogging about this issue and trying to raise awareness about it, um, book stuffing was the easy thing to point to because anybody could click on look inside an Amazon and see that a book has 10 more books stuffed in it when it really shouldn't. Um, but book stuffing was just one of the many things that these guys were engaged in. Um, and it was all about manipulation. So they'd been manipulating sales, they'd been manipulating rank, manipulating reviews, all to create the appearance of a bestseller. So they, some of them would be using click farms or bots to push a book to the top of the, top of the charts. They'd be purchasing, purchasing reviews. Um, they'd be incentivizing reviews with various prizes and things that you're not supposed to do. Um, any, any way they could gain the system and gain an advantage, they were doing it. And, and so when Amazon m kind of more or less stopped book stuffing a year ago, people thought that was the, prob the problem was solved, but they just, they just pivot to something else. Okay. And do you feel that you're fighting a losing battle here or is there progress being made? I mean, to be fair to Amazon, this is, this is not something they want to be happening but they are struggling perhaps with the tech, you know, the, you create a beast that's that big and there's fires being lit all over the place. Yeah. Are they doing enough? Are they putting them out quickly enough? No, they're not doing enough. Um, I think Amazon, I think Amazon doesn't want to police the Kindle store, which I can understand. There's 8 million pieces of content in there. There's, I don't know how many publishers and, and authors putting content there, a million, half a million. Uh, there's a lot. And I don't think anyone could reasonably expect them to police all of that. But can they not look at the 25 people they're giving all-star bonuses to every month? Can they not act on direct reports they get from you know, people who should be trusted information sources, people who've been around for a while? Like, in fairness to Amazon, they have taken out some pretty big people who are doing some pretty bad things. Um, but they had that information for two years before they did anything, because I gave it to them, so I know they had it. And so why didn't they act on it? So like, uh, without mentioning names, there was a, one of the biggest uh, romance scammers, um, uh, it was a guy actually, so in case anyone thinks I'm talking about somebody else, um, was banned um, a few months ago. And I know, because I've personally spoken to senior people about, um, on Amazon about that particular guy. And they had all the information, they had all the evidence they needed to move. And they didn't for two years. So like, just doing some back of the envelope numbers, like, 
they, they probably paid out millions of dollars from the KU fund, which is our money, you know, mm. they, and they, they paid that guy knowing that he was scamming. So I don't know how they can defend that. So. Yeah. Well, I suppose one of the things is having worked in an organisation with lawyers like the BBC is they, lawyers can be cautious and before yeah. you shut somebody down and end up in court having to defend it, you've got to be sure. You've got to have the evidence. And, but yeah, I mean, I don't know the inside story of Amazon, but I imagine that's a type of conversation that took place. Well, you know, we, we look at Amazon like one single entity. I imagine there were disagreements internally about this. There might be one team that wants to do something and another that, that doesn't want to admit they have a problem, you know? I think that is part of the problem yeah. sometimes. They don't want to admit if for PR reasons or maybe for legal reasons. You know, maybe they're worried about a class action or, or something else like that. Or maybe they don't want to disclose anything about their processes because they might think that aids scammers. I know they said that privately to me before. They've asked me not to publish certain information and I've respected that um, because they don't want to show where the hole in the fence is before they can fix it, for example. So just before we move off this subject, how many people here have seen evidence of what you think is wrongdoing amongst uh, your fellow authors online and maybe impacted you? Well... That's approaching half the room, I would say. Yeah. I mean, it's a problem of success. This is a blooming mm. industry that's gone, become billion dollar uh, turnover, and there's going to be bad actors. It's the level of which it happens, I guess, is the worry. Look, I, I, I was working for Google 15 years ago, and anywhere the internet and the money, in, money intersect, there's going to be scammers, right? But if I was Amazon, or if I could get Amazon to ask themselves one question, I would, get them to, I would get them to ask themselves, why is Kindle Unlimited in particular such a magnet for these people? Because like, you know, I've investigated some of these people and looked into their backgrounds, and they're not authors in most cases. In a couple of cases, they were. In most cases, they're not. These are guys that a few years ago were selling real estate courses or f diet pills or whatever the latest internet marketing scam is. Now, why have they descended en masse on the Kindle store? What is it about Kindle Unlimited? Because it was when the second iteration of Kindle Unlimited, the, the per page model, that was when it really spiked. So what is it inherent about that program that attracts this behavior? And what can Amazon change if they, if they do want to stop it? What can they change about that to, to, to make it less attractive for these guys? You know? OK, on a more positive note, David, yeah. um, what, would you, what advice would you give to somebody starting out now? Ooh, um, gird your loins, <laughs> I think, would be step one. No, I, I think like the, one of the most important things to do is, well, aside from the obvious stuff, like you need to treat this like a business and you know, when, when you are making business decisions like you know, what kind of cover uh, you should have in your book, you, that's, that's a piece of product packaging. It's not, you know, it's not an expression of your artistic yeah, yeah. vision. Like rein your inner artist in and just like, focus that side of your personality on the actual story, the characters, the, the words you're using. Um, but aside from, from that kind of basic stuff, I think it's important I think it's very important, and it's getting more important all the time, to have a good network of people around you that you, you trust to get advice from and you know, when you want to express frustrations or people that you want to cross-promote with. I think get to know your niche. Like, like look deeply at your niche at the Kindle store. See who the big sellers are. Look at what they're doing in terms of marketing and reaching readers and how they present their, their books, how they write their blurbs. Um, make sure that your stuff, well, I wouldn't say you know, copy anyone. Make sure it doesn't stand out as too different from what's working. Um, start, th th there's so much to tackle that it can be overwhelming and I think, you know, it's a good idea to, to try and prioritise. Like, I see some people trying to get good at BookBub ads and Amazon ads and Facebook ads at the same time. I think that's a lot to ask. I think taking each platform one by one is helpful. I think and even before that, I think you need to nail down your email game. I think that's like the first yeah. thing you should probably do, aside from, you know, learning how to write a book. That yes. helps too. That bit. Um, Brilliant. David, thank you very much indeed. And I want to say thank you also on behalf of the community for being our shop steward and being the guy who's uh, sort of watching our backs. And uh, uh, long may you feel energised to do that for us. So thank you. <laughs> Maybe not for too much longer. We'll see. It's a special gift for coming on to the very first uh, live SPF show. I have this. It's it's a, it looks, like, it a looks like a proposal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will you? Where my pin? Well, thank you very much. Um, I've got two of these to come here. So there is going to be, I promised Ellie, where is she? Oh, here? No, she's not worried, she doesn't get it. She, I promised her one. <laughs> Best question, gets a pin. These are sought after. I mean, they're valued at maybe one or two 50 dollars, pence. Think, yeah. <laughs> uh, they're great. Now, David, if you would uh, very um, sweetly uh, and smoothly swap places with the Ricardo and swap microphones with him, that would be great. We're now going to riff and make uh, comedic comments. Oh, I've got something for you, actually. 
We don't normally feature individual books, and this is a great, new, fantastic new book by Margaret Lashley. It's her first um, uh, psychological thriller, so she's a mystery, cosy mystery author. Margaret, is she in the room? She's in the room. She's uh, brilliant, from the South. Uh, we love it. I don't know if you just want to have a look at the dedication of the, uh, to the characters. Blatch and Smalls. Blatch and Smalls are the two characters in this first Margaret Lashley psychological thriller. Blatch is obviously inspired by someone she knows who she finds very inspirational, <laughs> whose mother is called Dolores Blatch, I've just learnt on page 114. Smalls. Now, if you're English, who's English in here? Is it just us? We're the only Brits. <laughs> Wow, you drove us all out in 1776. We're the only ones to come back. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, smalls is what we refer to the smallest part of your laundry. So we've been here 10 days at this point last year, and John Dyer said to Margaret Lashley, I've got to go and get my smalls washed, and she found this the, the most hilarious thing <laughs> she'd ever heard in her life. So she refers to him as smalls <laughs> ever since, and she's written a book where the detective is black. She's the only person to ever. She is the only person. Uh, Bar make that clear. Barney Smalls is the police sergeant, I think, in this, and uh, I'm Blatch. So that's brilliant. We are I'm absolutely thrilled she's done that. And if anybody else would like to include us as characters in their books, uh, we're cheap, and we will give you prizes in, in, uh, in response. We have a new guest. It's Spanish Jesus. It's Spanish Jesus. <laughs> which some people might find offensive. Well, that boat has sailed. But uh, yeah, long yeah, that ship has that. And um, Spanish Jesus does bless me. You did in the bar last night about one o'clock in the morning. You did lay hands on me. Did I? Yes. In what, in what way? <laughs> in a kind of uplifting way, I hope. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I felt yeah, uplifted I anyway. Uh, Ricardo Fayette, welcome to uh, my new chat show. Well, our, thanks our for having show. me on uh, on this couch. Yeah. So Ricardo, Reedy, you better tell people. Not everybody necessarily knows Reedy.com. You better tell us all about it. All right. Uh, well, if you really don't know about it, um, it's basically a marketplace where authors and publishers connect with editors, proofreaders, cover designers, illustrators, marketers, ghostwriters, author website designers, typesetters. I think, yeah, that's about it for now. Maybe translators in the future, we'll see. Excellent. So, Ricardo, one of the reasons, the reason we've got you and David on here, because I think both of you are people who... Have a beard? You enjoy your beer and have a beard. Is that what you said? You have a beer and yeah. enjoy beer. But you have a kind of overview of the industry, particularly at Reedsy, because you see spikes in demand for certain services and you see trends and so on. So again, sort of I started with David about how you're feeling about uh, indie community at the moment. Is it feeling buoyant to you? Yeah, it is. I mean, if we, if we look at the, um, at the demand on Reedsy, it's been growing every year um, and it's still growing. I think, I think the community is growing. Uh, it's just that maybe the people who are having success aren't as vocal as they were in the early days, which makes sense because in the early days, they were trying to attract more people in to try to share this new thing um, that self-publishing was. Now it's been going on around for, for a while. Um, and the people who, are, who have really found their niche and are having a lot of success with it, uh, they may not be wanting to spread that information everywhere or you know, maybe it's a question of personality as well um, but I know a lot of authors who are doing really really well and don't necessarily shout about it anywhere sure um, and then you know some authors who never stop going on about it I know <laughs> look at this screenshot of me next to JK Rowling and I know some who aren't authors yet as well yes thank, thank you very much yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ow. Ow. that's a fair that's a fair point actually I, I was just thinking I met um, I won't name any names but I met one author last night who is um, I won't even say the genre because she basically she is the genre but she's making about I would say $250,000 a month something like that for, for her books which is wonderful and incredible if you think about it but the the stories I think are better um, I'm, we, we have a conference next year in March, and I'm programming it at the moment. And the, the slot I'm most interested in is, is taking that um, Bezos letter from 2018, where he said in 2017 there were 1,000 authors who made $100,000 on Amazon, which doesn't take into account anyone below $1,000, $100,000, so the 50,000s, the 40,000s. So what I wanted to do was to, is to get on stage four or five authors who are in that kind of quitting job money level. Um, and so I put a quick post out to see if we could get some, some volunteers. And I had about 60 or 65 people who are you know, comfortably in that, from the six figures a month to the, you know, to the 20,000, 30,000 a year. Um, and 
that's that's the session I think is going to be the one that people who go to the event will leave remembering because it's it's it feels more attainable than people who are you know getting the the, the massive KU bonuses and you know, mm. that's I think that's the message that we want people to take away. Yeah, and I think that's the you know seven figures a year is we describe that as life changing, but actually. Forty or fifty thousand dollars a year that enables you to quit the nine to five job that you schlep in and out of. Yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. That's the life changing thing. Yeah. Suddenly you're working in your pajamas at home, and it's a liberating experience if you've never done it. Oh, you're wearing your. I was going to say, though, Ricardo is come, come in his pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are actually uh, a present from a, from a group of other friends. Yeah. Who uh, who enjoy my uh, my animal patterns on my clothes? <laughs> okay, so we probably can't. I, I would ask John to move in and get a close up, but that would be just weird. It might be. <laughs> yeah. It might yeah. Be but there's crocodiles idea. or are they gators? I don't know. We're in Florida. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they're, they're around. They're around here. Okay. Uh, what areas are actually, James? I should say, M Mr. Lefebvre at the back there said to me, um, "Remind James that lots of people listen to the podcast." So if we're going to be to describe, if there's going to be something visual reference, you do have to describe it. Which well, describe Ricardo's underpants then. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually we should get Mr. Lefebvre to describe them. Tom, don't you? Get the, get the up microphone to Mark and um, he can describe it. So you have this amazing uh, pink, bright pink, uh, you know, matching his eyes after he's uh, had a lot of drinks the night before with this beautiful blue aquatic, is it, it, is it crocodiles? What is it? I, I haven't gotten that close to your... To your uh, all alligators. Alligators there as well. And, and, and they just really, they really play off your eyes brilliantly. So that's uh, for all the people like me who listen to the podcast but don't always get a chance to watch because it would be dangerous while I'm driving. Yeah. <laughs> so I is, should also say, it's a very I, good point. he was out with Mark last night. Um, Okay, so <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Lefebvre had a, a like a, a books it was books and beer, wasn't it? Books and beer tour, yeah. A books and beer tour. Ah, so the brewery. Starting quite early, and did yeah. were, were there singlets involved? Eleven a.m. till uh, one a.m. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm quite impressed that they've that they're here today because um, yeah, they uh, well. looked pretty brutal. But to be fair, it's almost evening. Um, Good. Well, that was that was Thank beautiful you. description, Mark. Yeah. I can tell you're an author. I mean, it sounded, yeah. sounded a little <laughs> bit <laughs> sounded a little bit like you were making a pass at him rather than just describing his his pants. But anyway, well, um, the evening's young. Um, so, Ricardo, back to Reedsy in terms of your view of the industry. What are the big demands areas? What services are the ones that you think? Oh, I wish we had more people supplying. Um, I think the, the demand in terms of repartition uh, hasn't changed that much. It's still mostly editing and design in our marketplace because these are the two things that you really need for a book. Um, if you've got any money to spend, I'd say that those are the two services where you really want to spend your money. Um, then we've, we've had a surge uh, in marketing, so authors hiring individual book marketers. Um, and at the same time, we have um, We've had a lot less demand for publicity uh, because, well, it's a service that doesn't really make sense for 90% of authors, I think. Uh, unless you're writing a very specific nonfiction, um, you're better off hiring a marketer than a publicist. The publicist being someone who's just going to do PR for you, so trying to reach media, uh, bloggers, influencers, etc. So it was interesting because in the in the early days when we started Reedsy, it was all everyone wanted a publicist, you know, because everyone thought if for my book to get attention, it needs reviews, it needs to be on Oprah, it needs to be on all these shows. Um, and so everyone wanted look, was looking for that publicist. Now, most authors are looking for someone who's gonna maybe set up their first Facebook ad campaigns or improve their book web ads, uh, someone who's gonna teach them about Amazon algorithms. Um, so something more digital in terms of marketing uh, and that works a lot better for fiction. Yeah, and I think we see that as well, don't we? We teach people how to do this stuff, but we get probably an email at least once a week from somebody saying, how much money can I give you to do it for me? And we just, we don't have the, the time to do it, but there's a growth, there's a, a spin-off industry hmm. on the side of Indy. Don't hesitate to send them to, to Reesey. <laughs> yes, we'll send them to Reesey.com. I'm sure we've got an affiliate link. Probably have, yeah. yeah. Good, okay, look, I promise this to be interaction, interactive. We've got David there who's spoken, we've got Ricardo here. If you've got questions for either of them or Mark, or me, or Smalls, or Mickey, Minnie <laughs> over there. Would anybody like to ask any questions? Don't be shy. So let's turn it around a little bit and say... Um, I'll ask you a question. No, I'm not asking me a question. Just think, um, so 
I was here at Nink last year and the year before. And I'm just curious as to how people think, how, how have you seen things changing over the last 12 months? Who wants to take that one? I'm going to make Damon Gorney answer this one. Yeah, Damon's a good, good guy to answer this. So you do have to wait for the microphone. Damon? I'm waiting. I keep waiting. Be here the ears are coming. The ears are coming. Um, uh, in the last 12 months, uh, audio continues to grow like crazy like in, in ways that ebooks were seven, eight years ago. Uh, just so many more authors are getting into it. Uh, and the prices are coming down, the ability to create them. You know, it's always been, it's always been the, bar the biggest barrier to creating audio is the cost in the same way that translations are. I've seen a lot more translations. We have a lot more people asking us, can we do German? Can we do French? Things like that. And more than we have in any years past. And I think that's because the German market in particular has really opened up and they like reading in their native language, even though many of them can read in English. Uh, and then French and Italian markets are, have also opened up a whole lot. But all of those have a high barrier to entry because of that cost of translation and because of that cost of producing audio. Not to mention audio translation. I don't even know where you start with that. Um, those have been the biggest things that I've seen in the last 12 months that, that are continuing to grow. It seems like we've kind of reached that saturation point with the ebook market. Maturation, not necessarily even saturation, but we've reached a maturation of the ebook market. We have all the tools that any of us could need to make ebooks to get them out there. You have services, marketers, you can find people who do your ads for you. You can learn from Mark how to do your own ads. Like, there's a ton of a wealth of information about all how to do all of that stuff. So there's a big maturation in that market and all the tools that we need to produce that stuff. Now it's sort of, so I think we've kind of, I mean, there's still plenty of ways to go. There's, there's so many readers. Print is still the largest amount of sales across the entire world. So there's still a huge mountain left to climb. But I see a lot more indies looking to the next horizon as we sort of plateau in eBooks. Where is, where is the next piece where those monies are going to be coming from? I think German is, is a good point. I mean, I, that's, I'm focusing heavily on translation at the moment. So I've got three books in my Beatrix series that were translated uh, early this year, end of last year, and, and those are bringing in a couple of hundred euros a day now, just, just three books, and that's not hitting the kind of the KU all-star level with those books. So I, I know, you know, he's looking at around 400,000 pages isn't enough to get that, get the first tier of those, um, that level. Um, and so I'm, I'm doubling down now. I'm, I'm going into the Milton series and that. But the, the, the big thing is, as you say, it's, it's the cost of getting it done. It's looking at, we'll do a podcast on this at some point, but I've learned so much about, you know, you, you pay someone to translate something and that becomes a new literary work, which then needs to be edited. And I'm like, oh, well, I can't edit it. I don't speak a word of German. So, um, <laughs> so you're looking at about six to 7,000 euros per book to, to get that in. So that, that, is, that is an investment, a fairly heavy one. Um, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a fresh market that is looking for content. Um, and, and to answer the question about audio, au Audible is, is buying up content um, to get onto the uh, German Audible store. So you could license your translation, sell those rights um, directly to Audible, which is, is one of the th things I'm trying to do. So yeah, it's fun. I'm gonna pick someone else. Dave Chesson. Hi, let me just try something. Sprecher oh. Deutsch? Yeah, um, Sprecher Deutsch. He speaks, he, speaks. how many, seven languages? Is that no, five, five. 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 Only five. 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 Can I ask, I'm sorry to put you on the spot yeah. there, Dave. Can, how, you, how do you see, the, what have you seen over the last 12 months? How are things changing for them? Dave, Dave has um, kindlepreneur.com, so in a great place to. Uh, I would say that I'm seeing a lot more publishing companies take self-publishers a lot more seriously. I think that uh, a lot of the tactics that they used to kind of shy away from or think that that was kind of beneath them, I see them getting more involved. And I see them also reaching out to more self-publishers and bringing them in. And you were just talking about the international rights. I've seen a lot of international publishing companies also start to look at US success in self-publishers and reach out to them more often to offer, say, buying out the rights in that area. Stephen Geis of Mini Habits just sold his rights to a Japanese publishing company, and that company took his book to being the number two best-selling book in all of Japan, something he never would have done. And again, I think they're seeing this success and saying, you know, if it's working in the US, that can work in our country. We can apply our knowledge and understanding of our culture and be able to take it to the next level. 
Yeah. And the exciting thing about it for authors in your position is this moving into audiobooks, into translations, doesn't require new books and new writing and new plotting and planning. It's product that you've already got. Yeah, that's a fairly important mindset that I think it's that we should have is that you, you, you write your book and whilst you're writing it, it's, you know, you're invested creatively in it. It becomes your, you know, something that's very precious to you. As soon as you finish that, it becomes an asset that you can sell in lots of different ways. And, you know, the obvious way is to upload it as, as an e-book. Um, I'm, I, I've just done a print-only deal with a publisher in the, in the UK to get the books into um, stores in the UK, the US and Australia. Um, there's there's audio in English. There's audio in German, French, Spanish. There's translation in those in those languages as well. There's film and TV rights, and so once you have that intellectual property asset, you can sweat that asset in lots of different ways, um, and and new ways are, are being developed all the time. So it's it's something that can deliver um, almost in perpetuity for you. Yeah, that's well, what David was saying about being business orientated, and um, you know when you. You do inevitably have an emotional connection to a creative work. You also feel vulnerable about all the rest of it. You do need to park that a bit. Yeah, well, I'm selling widgets. That's what I'm selling. Yeah, little black widgets. You know, it's, it, you can't, you can't be that, and that kind of. It's very hard to do this. Is you have to kind of almost ignore a bad review. Doesn't mean it's not a, a, a slight. You shouldn't take it personally. This is at, at that stage. You are selling a widget just as someone is selling. You know. Um, dog food on Amazon. It's a ter terrible analogy, but I think it's, it's quite an, it's a useful one to, to get your head around. I want to, yes, we've got James here, James Rosson. Hold on, James, go come for the, the mic. microphone coming over. We're going to choose people from one side of them to the other constantly, <laughs> uh, David and Tom, uh, John and Tom. So my question is actually more for Dave here, is I've seen the trend that I've seen over the last couple of years is I've seen a lot more authors doing a lot of the co-authoring and I don't necessarily have an opinion one way or the other on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, because I think there are pros to it. But one of the trends that I've noticed over the last uh, probably 18 months, though, is there's one or two or a handful of authors who will co-author co with 10, 15, 20 different authors individually to create all these books. So then there's the one lead co-author who's on 400 or 500 or 600 books, and they're now ranked number eight in all of Amazon, and obviously getting the, the top the bonuses all the time. But as an author, personally, I struggle to crank out five books a year, edited, proofed, and everything else like that. So I just kind of wonder, how do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? And is that like the newest trend we're gonna see going forward? Is that something more authors should be looking at? Well, in terms, of, in terms of creatively first, before we get into the business side and the algorithm side, in terms of creatively, I think like a few years ago, there was a lot of talk of shared worlds and authors are going to work shared worlds, but I don't think it really took off um, as much as people thought it would anyway. I know some people are doing it relatively successfully. Uh, but in terms of algorithms, and that, that's a really interesting point about Kindle Unlimited because there are some people with various co-writing partnerships and some of them can be legitimate and some of them can be a little bit iffy. Um, but yeah, it is, it is kind of questionable, I would think, if you're putting your name on hundreds of books that you didn't write and then you're getting bonuses based on that. I think you know, that's something maybe Amazon should look at. Okay, so we've got some questions around the, the back there, yep. It's like question time in the BBC. You could be Boris Johnson for the purposes of this. Good. No thanks. Actually, it's a it's a partial answer, not a question. Uh, the, for KU bonuses, each author or author collection is counted individually. So if I write a book and I publish it, and I write a book with you and we publish it together, as far as KU bonuses are concerned, that's two different authors. So they don't stack. Um, if I write um, a, a book with you and 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 a book with you, those won't all stack for one big bonus for all of us. It, it, each individual author or team of authors is counted separately for KU bonuses. Okay, right. So just to wrap that one up, and um, thank you very much indeed, David. I do want to, before we finish, we don't want to have to restart the cameras again, I want to ask a question of a couple of people, which is uh, authors who are here. Uh, people listen to this podcast, we, are, we get asked a lot, is it worth going to conferences? So we go to 20 Books, we go to Thriller Fest in New York, there's RWA, you know, there's various conferences, you go to a lot of them, I know Ricardo. 
So not the, um, not the D2D guys and stuff, but the people who are here, like us, peddling a brand or whatever, um, but people who are here as authors, would they perhaps like to tell us why they're here and what they, whether it's worth it, perhaps talking to other authors? So guys, who are sitting down? How dare you sit down <laughs> in the middle of this production? Move over here. Scamper Mini, scamper. So I'm Deborah Holland, and I think NINC is a fantastic conference. One, because it's small, and two, it's very advanced with the material that we cover, and there's opportunity to meet a lot of authors and also to meet a lot of industry pro professionals. So NINC is definitely worth coming to. And I think other conferences, too, the same idea, RWA, lots of editors and agents there, lots of fellow authors to meet, lots of craft workshops as well. So I think the thing about conferences is it helps you be able to learn and to grow and to find people that will help network with you. And it's just, those are the wonderful experiences. And authors, you know, we have a pretty lonely life in terms of we're by ourselves. And yes, we might have a big online presence with people, but it, there's something about meeting people individually and that energy that comes from making connections and that, like, it, as you said, that ability that we have, that we are helping each other and we are empowering each other. And when you meet people at conferences, that helps you empower each other and yourselves. Thanks, Deborah. It's great. Cara, I'm going to ask you, because I know you go to quite a few conferences and you feel a benefit from it for your feeds into your writing or your marketing, which... Most definitely. I am not a full-time author. I'm still fairly early in my career. And yes, what, exactly what she said, the connections, but I like the social things in between the events, like in between the talks. And you have a conversation that's about nothing. And every now and then you get a little tidbit. And that's the little tidbit that gets you unstuck. That's the thing you were struggling and you did not even know you needed to ask the question. But when you hang out with people, you get to discover that nugget. And it's wonderful, very useful. Superb. Are you trying to say something? Yeah, no, I was going to say I've learned more things at the, at the Tiki Bar at Ming than <laughs> yes. during the sessions. <laughs> So and, if you could and, just and related to writing and publishing as well. <coughs> yes. We've learned lots of things at the Tiki Bar. We've learned quite a lot about you. <laughs> you just, just check the cameras as we wind up. Look, are we going to have to wind We are going to wind this up. That's still recording? A couple of minutes? Excellent. Two minutes. Good. Marcus. James. Three, five, this has been amazing. Yeah, we should do it again. Yeah, it's fun. It's, um, I, I, just, I love this conference. This is the, one of the first, the first one in the US I was invited to four years ago now, and I really enjoy it. It's, it's, it is, it's, it's, I don't think it's small, but it's a mixture between, somewhere between, it's kind of a medium level conference for four or 500 authors. But as Deborah says, um, you know, a fairly yeah, good level. Um, it's not basic. Um, and this weather is amazing. I love it. Yeah. Um, it's raining back home, so I'm getting it's messages awful. from my wife Everything's about how, awful back home. How, how wet it is. So it's, yeah. So who's going to the Tiki Bar tonight? We're, we'll probably be buying, so... Uh, and, uh, yeah, SPF drinks tomorrow night at the Shark Tooth Tavern. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that as well, because we did a... Our first pre on my first presentation was last year with Cecilia. We did a presentation... The cops are coming for you, Ricardo. Um, Again. We did a presentation on uh, lives, and it was interesting for me for the first time to do a presentation. It properly clicked with me that people come here to, to learn instructional detail. So we did a bit of general stuff about whether you should do them or the rest of it. When we started getting into the detail about doing it, everyone was note taken and coming up to us afterwards. And this is a place people make copious notes and go away with practical takeaways. And I think that's, this conference is a, just a little bit step up from the others in terms of that, um, which I think is great. So yeah, it's, it's a membership kind of thing as well, which feeds into that, so. Yeah. Right, well, we've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I think I'm gonna send this tape into uh, ITV. Or CBS and try and get my late night show. Who knows? All the, Bri all, the, all the late night show people are British, aren't they, in America now? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say for, for US friends here, who knows Alan Partridge? And it, oh, no, no one knows Alan Partridge. Well, this is basically Alan Partridge. Yeah. I mean, David knows Alan Partridge. And you know, there are, in you, I imagine. No, you're too young. God. He's old com and English. He's a, comedy, he's, he's a hapless comedy character. I like a man who knows who he is. I'm Alan Partridge, can I? <laughs> and I have been compared to him before. Uh -huh. OK, yeah, that's it. So we are going to say thank you very much indeed for listening and watching this week. Listening and watching. 
And thank you so much indeed for coming along and being a part of the show. It's been brilliant. So give yourselves a round of applause. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.